Uh, thank you, uh, this huge crowd that we have uh, together here today for joining us uh, for our next four sessions uh, and hands on play here at our Beat a Situationist workshop. I'm part of the team behind Walk, Listen, Create, which curates the yearly Sound Walk September, which is a kind of celebration of sound walks, where a sound walk uh, in short, is something where, in one way or the other, uh, a walking experience is coupled with listening in one way or the other, as I said. This year, part of Soundwalk September is Soundwalk City Prelude. Uh, Soundwalk September is uh, primarily a virtual festival. That is, it happens wherever you are, uh, because anyone can contribute and participate. Uh, but Soundwalk City Prelude is an actualization on the ground with a focus on Ljubljana, where Zona uh, has taken the lead in organizing a series, events, a series of events which physically take place in the capital of Slovenia. Um, and part of Soundwalk City Prelude is this very workshop uh, in which over the past week uh, already Pro Arts Gallery in Oakland uh, also participated. Uh, and yesterday with uh, pro arts uh, at a time more agreeable for those in California, uh, where now it's in the middle of the night, we had a first session on uh, ways to use intellectual property licensing against big business and the state to use it against those that normally use it to their own advantage. Uh, the, this be the situation is workshop is a combination of two types of events uh, after our first talk. Um, there is room for participants to physically explore your city using the mobile app DeriveWeb. But first, we have a series of talks, or sorry, first we have one talk, and then later we've got two more talks, and we finish with one at the end of the afternoon, uh, which are all in one way or the other, focusing on the use and abuse of public space. Um, so today we have got four fascinating talks. A bit later on, uh, we've got uh, Anja Podreka, who is, yeah, waving um, from Slovenia, and she will review the role of the river in the city and the extent to which nature is controlled in an urban environment. Uh, that will be followed by uh, Cecilia Quiles, who is of Buenos Aires in Argentina, and she will discuss the rich heritage of Argentine urban art and the visual language of protest and resistance. And we finish with Michael Quet from the American East Coast, who will talk about how society is changing due to the introduction of tools that are supposed to make our cities more safe and smart. And it's really between quotes, uh, more safe and smart. Um, his uh, specialty is um, digital colonialism. But we start with John Wilde, who will talk about how psychogeographic walking practices can be modified to research the digital city. John is a, a London-based artist who works across performance, sound, text, code, electronics, and machine learning, I'm impressed, uh, to carry out speculative research into the utopian and dystopian futures imminent within digital technology. Uh, and I was introduced to John uh, through a piece that he published in the magazine Street Notes, which is a peer-reviewed journal for the interdisciplinary study of the city. Uh, and in that article in Street Notes, he talked about digitally, a digitally expanded game of psychogeography, which uh, is indeed uh, connected to this talk today. So, John, the floor is yours. Okay. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. And I'm quite happy to have the, uh, the hardcore in the crew, in the room. The people. Uh, so if I just share my first slide. There we go. So, yeah. I think what I'm going to discuss is basically summed up in this uh, kind of question. This kind of question which is at the centre of both my arts practice and my more academic research, which is what kind of psychogeographical arts practice reveal about the production of digitally expanded space in East London. So that question incorporates, I think, three key areas. So first of all, psychogeography. So 
I'm, I'm really interested in the concept of psychogeography, which has its roots in the situationist, uh, in the situationist, but also the way it's been built upon, developed, branched out in different directions, uh, basically since the 1950s. So, psychogeography. John, can I interrupt you for a second? Yep. Uh, it's all it's all okay, but you are now sharing both the slides and your speaker notes. Uh, okay. So maybe that's not what you want. That's not what I wanted before. No. So. A second. What about yep. that? You're good. Is that right? Yep, perfect. Okay. So, so psychogeography is central to what I'm interested in, like contemporary psychogeography. I'm, I'm interested in its roots, but also what it can be, what it can become. And psychogeography is basically the study of the city through, through walking practices. Uh, but the city itself has been transformed at a rapid rate through uh, the introduction of digital technology, or, or what I'd call digitality, the kind of expansion of the digital into the physical in, in many kind of ways. So I'm interested in the impact of digitality on the felt experience of the city as you as you walk, as you experience it, and how you can maybe adapt psychogeography using various different techniques and tools to research and explore uh, the di uh, digitality within the city. And just to give this some boundaries, I, I've kind of restricted this kind of work that I've been doing to East London, which is the area where I live. And it kind of gives it a more embodied kind of connection in that I, I like to kind of root, like situate the research that I carry out within the kind of walking distance uh, from where I live. So, so it's basically mapping my own territory of existence around like, where I live. So hopefully in this talk, I'm going to kind of pick up on all of these themes in different ways. So psychogeography, its history, its roots, and also its possibilities for adaption into the future. Uh, digitality and its impact on East London, on the city, and basically East London itself. So the way I'm going to approach this is I'm rooting the talk within a kind of drift itself between two clusters of buildings. So the first cluster that I'm going to look at is a set of buildings in Limehouse in Poplar. And these are buildings which for me have got a key significance for East London psychogeography. And then I will connect that through a walk, not, not a physical walk, but a walk that I've carried out many times, to another set of buildings not very far from uh, the first cluster, which is a series of data centres which are central to uh, the UK's internet. And I think very much the, these buildings represent the digital city. I represent aspects of the digital city, which I think is important to discuss and draw out. So I basically hope that the the talk that I'm going to do will both take a horizontal route between these kind of clusters of buildings, but also a kind of vertical route through kind of the kind of history of psychogeography from its past to its potential future. So 
that's what I'm hoping to achieve. So the first clusters of cluster of buildings uh, are these three buildings, Limehouse Town Hall, the Siemens Mission at Limehouse and St Anne's Limehouse, uh, which are all kind of situated at the junction of Commercial Road and Burdett Road in Poplar. Now, through these three buildings, which basically are adjacent to the former triangle, kind of next to each other, I think you can map a lot of the key influences on East London psychogeography. So the first building that I want to look at is the Limehouse Sailors Mission. So the Limehouse Sailors Mission was built originally as a hostel for sailors. It then became a rundown and very notorious hostel for the homeless. It got transformed into a squat in the late 90s and through the process of gentrification which is affecting all of East London it's now been converted into luxury apartments. And I could definitely digress into the relationship between psychogeography and gentrification but I'm kind of going to avoid that to focus more on the digital city, I think. So that's Limehouse Sailor's mission. And the reason this has got significance to psychogeography for me and for East London more generally, is that the Sailor's mission was a secret location of the fourth conference of the Situationist International, which was held between the 24th and 28th of September in, nine, in the 1960. So, at this conference, this, the situation is declared a game of psychogeography as part of that conference in the area. And in many ways, I'd argue that this game of psychogeography has never finished. It's continued to, to today and people continue to play and explore psychogeography within this area. Now, I'm assuming at this conference most people know who the situationists are and a little bit about psychogeography. But just to give a very, very brief overview for anybody who's coming from it a little bit like without like, like not knowing. So the Situationist International were an international organisation of social revolutionaries made up of avant-garde artists, intellectuals and political theorists, which were prominent in Europe from 1957 to its disillusion in 1972. So You've got this group of intellectuals and avant-garde artists kind of coming together to explore different uh, programs for social revolution. And as part, that's central to their theories of a kind of revolutionary praxis was everyday life. Everyday life, like the experience of everyday life had to be a fundamental part of the kind of revolution they were calling for. And psychogeography comes into that in that it's the study of the built environment on, uh, well, this is Guy Debord's own definition. The study of the specific effects of the geographical environment consciously organised or not on the emotions and behaviour of individuals. So it's got revolutionary connections in that any future city must take into account the emotional, the felt, uh, affective responses of the environment on the individuals. So that's the situationist's uh, take on psychogeography. But what I want to do is I want to move over from the sailor's mission to the opposite side 
of Commercial Road to another building, which is St Anne's Limehouse. Now, St Anne's Limehouse represents a slightly different tradition within uh, UK and particularly East London psychogeography, which this represents a certain literary occult psychogeography. So, a map of St Anne's Limehouse appears in Ian Sinclair's book Blood Heat. So I don't know if you, you're familiar with Ian Sinclair, but Ian Sinclair is a UK author who kind of took on uh, the concept of psychogeography, but gave it this more occult uh, dimension along with other writers such as uh, Peter Ackroyd. So Ian Sinclair and the artist Brian Catlin claim to have traced the lines of influence connecting the eight great churches built by Auxmoor and St Anne's, this one, is at the intersection of three of these lines of influence. So within this occult psychogeography they are interested in things like ley lines, things like power which runs through the like occult power which runs through the city, which they believe architects such as Auxmoor or was a mason built within the structures of London. So St Anne's Limehouse is a key occult site within the like within the literary like psychogeographic tradition. So you've got these kind of two slightly different traditions in London psychogeography. You've got the uh, very politicised Marxist uh, tradition of the Situationist International and you've got this occult literary tradition of people like Ian Sinclair and Peter Ackroyd. In the garden of St Anne's Limehouse is this stone pyramid which also features on the cover of Ian Sinclair's book Lord Heat. Uh, the pyramid itself is called the Wisdom of Solomon. But in the early to mid 2000s it was also the site of sex magic rituals organised by a group called Evil Psychogeographics, I don't know how you pronounce it properly. Uh, this individual stroke group was based just over the wall behind Limehouse, uh, St Anne's Limehouse, in the Limehouse Town Hall. So you've got these three buildings. Limehouse Town Hall itself is a former administrative centre and assembly rooms. Uh, once it ceased to be a, a kind of administrative centre like a council building, it became the National Museum of Labour History and was briefly the, the, the home of Kropotkin's desk. Uh, but currently it's kind of like it's not a squat it's kind of like a squat but it's the it's, it, it's the host of a kind of esoteric mix of artists and theorists and cultural activists and it's a it's former te tenants have included activists such as the space hijackers or mute magazine uh, or object block within is it held the archive of the London Psychogeographic Association. So the London Psychogeographic Association was a, a very active psychogeographic group that functioned in the 90s. It produced like numerous newsletters and the final newsletter was produced in around 2000. 
the London Psychogeographic Association's texts read of a uh, read as a very uh, provocative mix of both the occult and the Marxist tendencies in kind of East London psychogeography. And some people have dubbed this kind of like mixing of the occult and the Marxist tendencies as Magico Marxism. If you, if anybody's interested in following up this kind of references, the uh, newsletter for the London Psychogeographic Associations can be found uh, in the library of the May Day Rooms. So if, if you look up May Day Rooms, which is an activist centre uh, in London, all of uh, these newsletters are featured there. And it's kind of really interesting and bizarre texts. So if you're interested in the kind of more esoteric takes on the city, then check out their, their literature. There's an example here of one of the uh, leaflets that they put out. Uh, at the time when a far right group became elected in East London. Uh, this is republished in uh, a book by Ian Sinclair called Lights Out for the Territory. So what I hope I've done through these three buildings is given you a picture of uh, the kind of contested field of East London psychogeography, which stretches from this kind of very situationist uh, and materialist approach to psychogeography of the Situationist International to the literary tradition of people like Ian Sinclair, which kind of like brings in the kind of occult and the mysterious within the city, and the London Psychogeographical Association, which kind of brings them together into a kind of very strange Magico Marxism. Now, where does the digital come into this? So, Outside of Limehouse Town Hall, between these three buildings, this manor cover is situated on the ground of Commercial Road. But between these three sites, this manor cover uh, features the name Colt. Colt is an interesting uh, company. It's kind of one of the core companies for laying uh, what they call dark fibre. So the, 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 they lay uh, fibre optic cables throughout the city, which then they rent to different companies so that they can connect them through to core data centres. So Colt is very much one of the companies which is at the centre of the kind of digital network within the city. And from a psychogeographical point of view, it's kind of where I come in to some level and the work that I've done with a, a collective called Coded Geometry. So Coded Geometry are also rooted in Limehouse Town Hall. They, they took over the same space as the London Psychogeographical Association had stored its map, maps and its uh, stuff previously. But coded geometry are uh, they're not so much interested in occult power are the occult power of ley lines. They're interested in the kind of material occulted power of the digital within the city. So these underground fiber optic cables uh, enable the internet, they enable the kind of high speed trading and the kind of surveillance capital which is described uh, by people like Zuboff in, in their book, Surveillance Capitalism. So these underground networks of cables are the kind of flows of data and the flows of capital 
which run through the city. Very much like the kind of occult power described by that tradition of psychogeography, but in a kind of very material sense. Like these are the flows of power. Now, just a little bit more in depth about coded geometry and a little bit about their kind of philosophy or kind of manifesto. So, coded geometry are a mix of telecoms engineers, hackers, and activists. And they're kind of interested in developing a kind of mutant form of psychogeography as a form of research towards establishing kind of peer-to-peer -peer networks of cities, of communities. Uh, so, at the core of this kind of, their version of psychogeography is to seek out the kind of occulted influences of the digital on the felt experiences of urban space. So they're interested in kind of developing different forms of psychogeography, which expose the kind of in, invisible geographies of the digital within the city. So one way that they've done this, uh, what one of the practices that they've carried out is, is mapping these underground networks of dark fiber through carrying out drifts following dark fiber networks. By following the dark fiber networks, you kind of both exposing the kind of underground flows and the infrastructure of the city, but also through those walks, you're experiencing the physicality of the city in a different way as well. And I know someone earlier was talking about following underground rivers or discussing underground rivers. I think it, there's some very similar connections, really, in, in this kind of practice. So, if I can find on this map, can you, can you see my mouse? Wonder. Yeah. So, Commercial Road, which I've been talking about, and these buildings, is around here. So, these three buildings uh, around this side. So by following the traces of this underground network, the traces are basically the manhole covers, which we can find, which name the kind of like companies who lay the networks. So by following from Limehouse, from this history of psychogeography, it leads us a long commercial road and East India Dock Road to these kind of black smudges here, which are my next cluster of buildings, which these clusters of buildings are two campuses uh, of data centers. So one called Global Switch and one called Telehouse. Uh, together, there's basically six buildings that form these two campuses, but they're all connected, they're all side by side. And these are the central hub in the UK's internet. So the first campus I want to look at is Global Switch. So, Global Switch campus comprises of two data centres. So, London East, which is this larger one, and London North, which is this low rise one. So, Global Switch East hosts several financial uh, services cust cust sorry, customers and enterprises. Uh, so, customers such as Google, Fujitsu, uh, clarinet and data pipe. So this is very important to the kind of financial industries and data collection, etc. So very rooted within the kind of contemporary capitalism, the kind of data capitalism that is dominant at the present. 
Now, Global Switch North, which is this low-rise building, which is quite an interesting building. This is the former uh, printing presses for the Financial Times. Uh, but now it's been converted into this data centre and its significance is that this is the termination point of Atlantic Crossing 1 which is the, the main subsea optical telecommunications cable that connects the UK to the US. So this is where that undersea cable from the US arrives into London and then connects all of the other data centers. So it's very likely that this talk will be currently fed into this data center, into its cable, and for anybody who's connecting via the US, it will be going through that series of servers and networks kind of currently while, we, while we're talking. The second campus is uh, Telehouse. Telehouse consists of four key sites. Uh, Telehouse is one of the oldest data centres and it is the UK's central hub. So at some point most of the UK's internet travels through uh, the Telehouse campus. Uh, the Telehouse campus is part of the, what they call the London Internet Exchange, which is the, the fundamental backbone of the global internet. Uh, this building that I'm showing here is a more recent building. This is Telehouse North 2, and it's the only UK data centre to, uh, to own uh, a 132 kilovolt on-campus grid system that's directly connected to the national grid. So this is like a mass, mass power station basically to power these things. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this kind of when I get, when I'm talking about the specifics of the uh, the kind of drifts that code of geometry have carried out. But by walking these data centers, by, by finding out these, like the physicality of, of the internet, then it's a very, very different picture to the kind of ephemeral picture of the cloud or cloud computing, which is sold to us. So when we experience a site like Telenorf 2 with its uh, on-campus grids, like, like electricity grid system, you're kind of confronted by this physicality of uh, the centre itself, but also its consumption of electricity and the power that's needed to store this data and process this data. So from particularly an environmental perspective, it gives a different picture on the kind of I, I suppose the myth of the cloud, it roots like by, by physically going there, by walking these sites, it, 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 it breaks down that kind of myth of the cleanness of the internet and exposes you to this kind of, this solid physicality. So I think that's why kind of walking practices uh, are important to understanding the digital within the city and why groups like Coded Geometry are kind of like using these kind of practices what seem quite at odds with the digital to, to experience the digital. I hope that makes some sort of sense. You can ask me, ask me to clarify that kind of when I finish. So I don't want to go too much further into, uh, into theory, 
But I just want to give a quick overview of the way that coded geometry define the digital within the city. So they break the digital down into uh, four key aspects. Um, and through thinking about those four key aspects, it's the way that they approach developing working practices or strategies for uncovering the digital within the city. So they consider these four aspects, the ontics, aesthetics, logics and discourse. Uh, so to be what forms the digital. So ontics describes the kind of materiality of digital technology. So while this is kind of rooted within the uh, materiality of digital itself, the kind of storage of notes and ones for electromagnetism, it also describes the kind of materiality of the wider infrastructure, the sorts of things that I've just been uh, showing you, the kind of underground networks of cables that run through the city, or the physicality of cloud computing or the kind of modern human machine to machine communications, the kind of way that machines communicate amongst themselves. That's kind of part of the physicality of uh, the digital. So seeking out the kind of physicality of the digital is one strategy that they're interested in when developing their working and psychogeographical practices. Uh, another is the aesthetics. Aesthetics here understood as the body's reaction to the look, feel, the effective response to and, and the spatial imaginary of digital technology and what it brings with, into the space. So this includes the kind of the speed of the city and the way digital impacts, digitality impacts on this. This might be uh, algorithms used within things like uh, the traffic system, which affects the kind of flow of traffic through the system, which creates certain rhythms and flows. So this kind of, the way that affects, so it's very much a kind of embodied affective response to the city, but also uh, bringing out the way that the digital now is fundamental to that. Uh, that might also be the, the way that algorithms within design software affects the way that buildings are designed or, or the city's designed, etc. Uh, logics is a, a direct response to the way machine in the bringing machine learning or algorithms we've into the logic of the way that space is structured. So the way that uh, space, like the digital is now fundamental to the production of space. So if anybody's kind of read Lefebvre's The Production of Space, I think now we've got to take into account this extra aspect of uh, of the digital as part of the logic of the reordering of space. I mean, a very simple example of that is uh, the way that like, searching for pizza in your area impacts on the, on the I street itself, that the, the way that Google algorithms favor certain establishments over others, ultimately restructure and alter what shops exist within space. So that's the kind of logics of the digital in the city. And finally, discourse, which discourse focuses on the narratives, the cultural myths, ideologies and assumptions that stabilise and destabilise power and control through digital means. So we're particularly interested in, in the kind of the corporate myths of the digital. I've already spoke about the cloud and the way that cloud computing is given this kind of very clean, this very sleek, the image itself of, of the cloud, uh, where the reality of cloud computing 
is very destructive to the environment. It's kind of it's its physicality is kind of like raw and industrial. So by carrying out walks where we expose these myths, then it's hoped that new myths and new kind of ideas of uh, the digital can can emerge. So through those four for understandings of the digital, that's these come into the way that coded geometry develop its walking and drifting and psychogeographic kind of practices. So I just want to conclude by just looking at four examples, four practical examples of the walks that myself and coded geometry have carried out. I've already touched on uh, a couple of these through linking up the various elements of this talk. The first one is mapping and following the dark fibre networks. So exposing above ground these flows of data and power which are constantly running below our city streets. Uh, we've carried out quite a few dark fibre network drifts where we take groups of people, like uh, it varies between 2 to 20, depending on who's, who turns up. And we walk various like of, of these routes. And um, this is kind of connected up now with some of our first drifts, which were searching for the cloud. So searching for the cloud was seeking out these elements of the cloud within the city, which I've already discussed. But by connecting that now up with the dark fiber networks, these dark fiber networks always intersect with cloud computing. So these kind of like these two kind of drifts, like now connect up pretty much into a single single flow. So you can follow underground fiber optic networks which ultimately will, will guide you to the cloud centers within the city. And these strategies you can do within any, any city because all cities now have got these kind of infrastructures. And I, th I think Psychogeography, which has got these two aspects. I, I haven't really defined psychogeography too much, but it's got these two aspects, which is the actual walking practice and the mapping practice. So the extraction from the walk to a kind of mapping practice. And I think psychogeography is well placed for, uh, for mapping the kind of complexities of data center relations which kind of inter intertwine the kind of micro extractions of surplus value from data to this kind of macro extraction of fossil fuels i think through through walking and connecting these places we can then abstract and kind of build a kind of more mapping practice of the way that these things intersect and interconnect and I think that's that's something that we're kind of interested in developing further. Uh, but also the kind of more ephemeral, effective responses can be drawn out, maybe through more artistic means. So the kind of felt experiences of these sites, the way that they they are they are public space. You can walk to them and around them, but as architecture. They are very hostile, and, and they get and they produce a kind of well. A lot of the ones we've worked on produce a kind of very paranoid feeling, because the buildings are faceless and CCTV covered, as you can kind of see in this. The kind of like high fences and barbed wire, etc. It's kind of very paranoid architecture. So I think you can also extract the kind of more affective kind of responses and. and that kind of lends itself to a kind of more poetic response, I think. Uh, 
So just moving on to another experiment that we carried out. Uh, man vs main complex. This was an experiment in carrying out drifting using Google Maps itself. So using street maps to, to walk certain territories. So on this drift, it's kind of almost the opposite. It's, it's the reverse of, of walking and it's a dive into the kind of situation of spect uh, spectacle in that we had a very large projection screen printed up, uh, not printed up, but projected up. And then we kind of walked around certain locations just using the kind of, the kind of that weird kind of motion that you get within street view. And we were kind of interested between the the kind of contrast between the kind of corporate representation that Google places within these environments. I mean, each image at some somewhere has kind of got Google logo kind of watermarked into this environment. But that contrast in that with the kind of emergent storytelling that comes from kind of people involved in exploring these areas through this kind of virtual way. So kind of kind of this contrast, I think, between the kind of restrictions of the corporate and then the escape through through the kind of alter storytelling or representations which come from people who are experimenting and walking virtually these spaces, which we found quite interesting. And then another practice that myself and coded geometry have been interested in is the idea of invisible geographies. So exposing the the aesthetics and the sound of machine to machine communications. So what you're seeing here is an image of people using uh, homemade antennae to listen to communications within well, within the environment. So we can carry on walk, carry out walks, listening to the machine to machine communications. What, what these two people are doing here is they've picked up the sound of some sort of Wi Fi communication. So they were stood at this location listening for about 10 minutes, kind of mapping out its, its spatial relations. Because the interesting thing about, uh, digital communications is because they are microwave, they are very spatial. It's not like radio where you're picking up the same broadcast from everywhere. Like you can walk into a zone of data and listen to it and kind of move kind of like just your arm further away and find its boundaries. So, so mapping the physicality of the communications within the space is what the kind of invisible geographies uh, practices have been about. And there's, we've got an alternative version of this, which has started to use software-defined radio. So if anybody's interested in software-defined radio, by using software-defined radio, you can use different antennae to tune into that quite precisely. So these antennas are quite blunt and pick up everything. So it's kind of quite noisy signals what you kind of move between. Whereas using software defined radio, uh, these walks have been able to tune into particular frequencies. So you might want to tune into uh, 5G mobile phone networks, which you don't get, you don't get people talking because it's encrypted and because it's data, but you, you do get the kind of flows of data between technologies. So these are the kind of experimental practices that we've been carrying out, kind of listening to the machine to machine communications, trying to understand the kind of machinic aesthetic that comes with that and their spatial properties. So 
coming to the end, I think what what we see as the problem is that the digital within the city is invisible. Uh, it's 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 kind of disappeared within to, within the city. Now this guy Visor was is a computer scientist, and he's one of the people who promoted uh, the idea of ubiquitous computing back in like. 1991 and this is a quote from him which the most profound technologies are those that disappear weaving themselves into the fabric of everyday life until they are uh, indistinguishable from it now what was that that is definitely what's happening with the introduction of ubiqu ubiquitous computing internet of things smart cities smart technologies this is all rooted in this kind of way of thinking. But the problem with that is the more you make this kind of data gathering, the technology part of everyday life, uh, people's ability to consent, people's ability to de develop a kind of ethics of these technologies is disappeared as it becomes invisible. So the practices of uh, myself and coded geometry is to you to expand psychogeography as a form of radical uh, pedagogy to make these uh, invisible digital structures knowable and bring them into a wider discourse through the kind of poetic imaginary that they inspire so the kind of walking practices the listening the playing is all to kind of make these invisible technologies knowable and then hopefully we can develop more uh, more interesting poetics imaginaries and ethics to, to kind of like move with these technologies so hopefully that connects up Hopefully, I've connected the these the concept of psychogeography as it's kind of understood in as it's developed in East London to what we understand as the digital city and the way that psychogeography can be uh, developed, used as a way of exploring the kind of contemporary city and the kind of the new features of the digital as it becomes key aspects of the city and, and in particular of the felt experience of the city. So that's, I'm going to leave it there because I think i am just about, got about three minutes to be out of time. So. Thanks, John. Um, I thought that was really nice. Um, very um, um, holistic uh, is also what I would say because you covered a lot of ground um, um, but also, it leaves us very little time for questions, uh, but because it was uh -huh. holistic, uh, a lot of the questions that I had were answered by yourself already in your talk. Uh, but I have one question that I want to emphasize before we uh, finish with uh, with this uh, part of uh, the day. But I first want to point out that I really appreciate how you connect ley lines with dark fiber networks uh, and superposing uh, the two. Uh, because if anything, what it also reminds me of is the is myth making. Um, you know, maybe in, in a distant past there were past uh, um, civilizations that uh, occupied the earth, right? And if they if they existed, they completely disappeared. Well, did they? You know, typically myths or stories, histories uh, could carry little uh, bits and pieces of. Um, uh, past uh, histories to the present and uh, ley lines could be one of those things and actually they could have been dark fiber networks of past civilizations uh, so yeah i really liked that superposition but i also uh, really appreciate how you um, point out that the cloud is indeed not something that exists up in the sky or is completely virtual no there is a, an extensive physicality uh, to the cloud uh, also using up a lot of uh, space, but also energy. Um, so I, I also appreciate that. But my my question that I uh, want to put to you uh, before we wrap up uh, is something that you hinted at at the end, but that is 
how can we use uh, your psycho, your kinds of psychogeographic practices, um, or how can we in general uh, use the ideas of the situationists or your practice indeed with coded geography, geography to influence how um, we are being cajoled into um, having to having to accept the negative consequences of uh, how the digital influences our presence in the city. I mean, I, I think uh, I think that's kind of what I was trying to gr get at with the idea of resistance. So I, th I think I think these practices. It's very much about drawing people in to expose the invisible. So, so developing te uh, techniques that expose the invisible, expose the impact, but in a way that gives people the ability to develop new stories, new myth making, as you said. I mean, I mean, there's definitely part of myth making in in the idea of coded geometry. Uh, but we need we need new stories which which can challenge. The kind of surveillance capitalism that that we exist that that is fundamental really to why technology has been used in the way that it's been used at the moment, and maybe by by exploring these through walking with other people, which I, I find one of the things about walking is it's brilliant to get people telling stories, to get people thinking, to get people uh, making up their own kind of possibilities. Which, which is what we want. We want, we want not, not us coming with a kind of a revolutionary platform of this is what we need to do. We need people to start developing alternative ideas of the way we could use these technologies. It's like a, a lot of the people around, like involved around uh, these practices are themselves, like do themselves work with in, infrastructure, work with coding, etc. And can see that these technologies could be used in a different way. That I mean, the reason why the cloud computing takes up so many resources is purely because of the mass storage of data that it's collecting, which then is used as a secondary sales, etc. But that level of processing, the level of processing which goes into whether or not you get an advert which is directly connected to your previous history, etc., which is a mass amount of processing, could be used for more environmentally sustainable reasons, for, for connecting with how we can alter the city, how peer-to-peer -peer networks can be like can function, which can undermine the kind of hierarchy of cloud computing. So I, I think by developing these strategies, we are creating a community where new stories can emerge and new ideas and, and working with other people to, to try and rethink the digital city, to perhaps uh, develop like, ideas of a future city or future cities. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, as you uh, say, also said in your last slide, and what you are also emphasizing here is that knowing is half the battle. Uh, if we don't know um, the extent to which uh, we are being manipulated and how we are being manipulated, we also cannot act uh, on it. Um, and by um, understanding how um, these things influence us and influence society, we can devise ways to uh, to 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 deal with it or to counter it. Uh, yeah, no, very true. All right. Well, thank you very much, John. Um, uh, yeah. I hope also it was enjoyable for you. Um, yeah. uh, thanks. And I hope you're going to stick around because there is uh, uh, quite a lot more to come.